Hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, we are at the uh, Country Homes Boulevard Restoration Project, and today uh, the presenter will be Colleen Little. Uh, Colleen works with Spokane County, and she has over 20 years of experience in stormwater management and has served as Spokane County's regional stormwater uh, facilities project manager slash project engineer uh, from 2008. And uh, today's presentation will be on Country Home Boulevard Restoration Project, which involves uh, navigating the FEMA Lomar Clomar process, uh, a mile long water quality facility, um, bioengineered soils, 25,000 plants, and and more. So with that, I'll turn it over to Colleen. Thanks. All right, good morning. Um, so today we're going to talk about, uh, the, big, the big picture here is that uh, Spokane County took a mile-long asphalt channel um, with zero water quality treatment and almost no flood control and turned it into a very beautiful yet very functional regional stormwater facility. So we'll talk just briefly about the project location, project purpose, uh, show you an overview of the drainage area and the type of facility that it is. So here's an overview of the watershed. This is a two and a half square mile drainage area, um, the yellow dashed line. The project area is um, between the two red dots. And it's hard to tell here. If I added topography, it would have made the map really confusing. But the whole area, the upper area, is a, um, the Five Mile Prairie. It's a very high, very high plateau that drains to this location. Overall, this location does have a surface channel that flows all the way, could flow, a better term, all the way to the Little Spokane River. Um, it exists. Uh, the water does not actually flow all the way there, but there's definitely a connectivity to our Spokane Aquifer. Um, that's just a quick look at the drainage uh, basins. C8 is where the project is located, basically the blue line up the middle. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about the Clomar Lomar. I did put that in the objectives, but uh, this is a water quality conference, so we're not going to talk too much about that. But the project is in a delineated floodplain, um, and it was a, about a two-year process to get through a Clomar, then construct, build, and we just got our Lomar last year. And it was constructed in 2014. So it was probably seven years total, uh, start to finish. And here's the facility cross-section, uh, AHBL's graphic here is really wonderful. Basically, the facility, you can call it bioinfiltration, bioretention, rain garden. It has a little bit of everything. Um, it mostly is bioretention, though. It's got the 18 inches of bioengineered soil that you've heard discussed in a lot of the other uh, presentations. Um, it does fu function like a bioinfiltration in the sense that there are overflow structures uh, situated about 18 inches off the bottom, that if the facility fills up beyond the water quality storm, it'll spill into those and um, is conveyed in a 48-inch squash pipe um, for the full mile, basically replicating the V-ditch channel that was there before. Uh, again, mile long, we because it's in such a visible corridor, 25,000 cars a day, um, and sort of a first of its kind in eastern Washington, um, we have several regional stormwater facilities in Spokane County, but this one is one that everybody drives by. It's a connector, um, like I said, a very busy arterial. So we incorporated uh, plant design. Um, I know nothing about plants, which is why we hired the AHBL. And the plant palette mimics in the neighborhoods a lot of what they were seeing there. There are some plants that are consistent throughout, but there's a theme through each little location. Um, mostly different trees in each section, and um, there was a theme of sort of a yellow, white, and purple flowers, which is um, really nice. Um, another kind of unique feature to this is because there are 21 overflow structures in the one mile length, none of them more than about 300 feet apart, there are seven foot diameter concrete manhole structures. We had to have pullouts to, that could support a vector truck to get up next to them and clean out, jet out the pipe, and clean any sediment out. So um, these access points have, they were a, a complicated um, construction. 
So pre-construction for this, uh, we talked a little bit about the existing conveyance. The channel is an average of, was an average of 30 feet wide and about four feet deep. Um, storm water from all of the local neighborhoods and groundwater springs permanent base flow in this channel and coming into the facility directly into the channel from about five different locations. Um, again, no water quality treatment locally and really no flood control management. Um, one of the bigger challenges for this project was um, there's a bottleneck uh, right here in this picture at the end. So you've got this 30 foot wide channel and it necks down to a concrete box culvert and then goes cross country through about 15 parcels in their backyards. We don't do that anymore. We don't put drainage channels and easements through people's backyards because it just is, uh, you don't know what happens back there. We'll get to see those pictures in a minute. So that was sort of the spring. What does it look like in the spring? Uh, during the summer, um, lots of vegetation growth, believe it or not, lots of sediment got in the channel, seeds get in there, crazy stuff would grow. Uh, flow would be restricted, mosquitoes, algae, it stunk, and lots of visible trash. Um, again, this is in the middle of summer. This is base flow, groundwater, and the asphalt channel slope was less than a half a percent in some places, so really not much movement, lots of stagnant water. This is what the plant material looked like when it would just kind of fall over and die. Our Geiger work release crew would come through and rip it out and throw it on the banks. People would call and say, why'd you leave it there? I'm like, well, we're not leaving it there, but it's wet and it's heavy. So they would leave it there for a couple of weeks to dry in order to haul it off in an easier fashion. In the winter, um, bank full conditions a lot of the time. Uh, rapid snow melt, we'd get our Chinooks in our area where um, on top of the snow we'd have ice dams. This is again right at that bottleneck. Um, often would go over the road there too. And the Vern Ziegler ditch, my favorite. We like to say that for a two million dollar project that the one mile that that was the easy part, this was the hard part. I know every single owner, their children, their dogs, everything about them because I had to visit with them, try to get new easements through their backyard, convince them that burying a pipe back there was better than the mess they had. Um, the existing easement on the plat was only 30 feet wide and you're gonna see in some of these pictures, in some cases people built right up to their property line. So their 15 feet on their side was already gone. So I had to get equipment into 15 feet to work. So that's a better picture overall of the drainage channel that went through. Termination point is at Price and Wall. We have a big regional facility there that was built in 2008. So this is what it looks like um, on the other side of the concrete bridge, but it literally necks down to nothing. Uh, cyclone fences, um, people through their grass clippings and God knows what back there, really just stinky, messy. You can see right here, uh, here's a swimming pool and their fence is right on the property line, so 15 feet gone. Gazebo and fence in the easement area. Um, that's the other side of the fence, so I had 15 feet to get in there with equipment. Uh, the channel went right through several backyards. An interesting fact to this is Originally, our application with the Department of Ecology, because this is a stormwater retrofit funded project, 75-25 match with ecology, um, we originally weren't going to do anything in the Vern Ziegler ditch. But as time passed, we are like, we're not really providing the full solution if we don't. So it was a hurry up and try to get easements and talk to people. The last three properties refused to participate. So we did pipe it um, that far. It's mounded in the last lot a little bit. And then it goes through, the last few people I told them, I said, if you don't say yes now, it can never happen without a drop structure in the middle of your backyard. So um, they were just a little distrustful for their own reasons. But um, it is a bioretention system. Uh, the bioengineered soil is the same mix, the 60-40 that you've heard. Um, we, the way we wrote it in our spec was we gave them three different options of how to get the soil amended and they chose to batch mix it off site, test it, and then bring it in in a thousand cubic yards at a time. There was about 7,000 cubic yards of material and they were doing really great at first, batch testing, everything was great and then all of a sudden I went out one day and there's like 2,000 yards placed and no one had tested it. Pause, test, not working. So they had to amend the soil, retest and um, 
yeah, so a little complicated to do that with a lot of soil. Um, so this is during construction. Uh, the roadway, there's one lane in each direction, north and south, very wide lanes, wide enough that we were able to compress the lanes to the outside and we kept both lanes open the entire time. Construction vehicles queued up um, on the inside closest to the road. Um, this is what the maintenance pullouts, just sort of the progression of how that worked. Um, initially, there was no, um, Spokane County likes to coordinate with the other departments to make sure that if we're, this was not a road project, this was a stormwater project. I kept asking, is there anybody that wants to participate, anybody doing anything? And at the last second, this went out to bid the beginning uh, in April, and in January, our utilities department said, we want to put a redundant sewer force main down the southbound lane. Awesome. So it was a completely, <laughs> yeah, completely, by the way, right, exactly. So completely different engineer designing it, completely different set of plans, different bid schedule, different packet, but all bid I mean, all at the same time, and then trying to coordinate it, um, paving right up to plants that were being, you know, planted. It was, it was, it went a lot smoother than I thought it was going to. But um, the plant procurement—that is also an interesting fact. Again, twenty-five to twenty-seven thousand plants. We probably could have got by with twenty, but who knew? It's still awesome. Um, the plants came in from Oregon. We did a early plant plant procurement in February that year because there were no greenhouses in our area that could possibly provide that many plants if we'd waited until May when it went out to bid. Um, also some of the plants that were specced were larger variety, more mature, and so they needed to be grown sooner. So it was about three different nurseries in Oregon. They showed up once a week for five weeks, unloaded like you saw in the pictures, counted and planted. It was very highly organized. Vern Ziegler Ditch is one of the best, and we call it Vern Ziegler because that's the name of the plat, just kind of stuck. But um, this is one of the best parts of this project because these people gained back a yard area. Um, again, they no longer had flooded, saturated lawns. Um, the section of the pipe that we put in removed them from the floodplain, um, at least in the 100 year event. Um, which is great. So they had no more flood insurance for some of those folks. This is maintenance access back to a structure. Like I said, these people have a yard now. Um, this is where the pipe ended, right there, mounded up a little bit in the background. We pushed their, the channel that bisected their yard off to the back of their um, property so that they, again, got, they gained a yard out of this. Um, so again, some of the construction challenges were the sewer force main. That tight corridor, we had some summer thunderstorms. Um, one of the big things that we ran into was, um, even though we did soil testing in advance, we had a section of the um, project that had unsuitable soils. We had a big summer thunderstorm and went out there and not a single thing was draining. It was just ponded water from for about 500 feet. Quickly, probably the only change order of any significant value on the project um, ended up with sort of a burrito wrap, gravel infiltration gallery. Got that in. I mean, I had to stop work for a little while, but um, yeah, AHBL was great in getting that out for us, and our contractor was amazing in backtracking to do some other work. We also had some erosion issues. Uh, the project is not curbed end to end. It was going to be too expensive and the energy dissipation at all those point source locations was going to be a little complicated. But at the nose ends of the intersections, we had some problems with erosion that we had to deal with. Um, this is one of the groundwater springs, comes out the side of the ladies yard and into the road. So we had several of things like that that we had to pick up and directly bring into the um, project. Some post-construction challenges that I never would have anticipated, site distance. So this project, we made the contractor and landscaper responsible for two full years for the plant life um, and maintenance. More, we did that more for ourselves than anything, just to kind of watch and see what was gonna happen. Didn't really know what the landscape maintenance contract or commitment was gonna be. So, one of the plants we got, and I'm not a plant person, so everything looked fine to me, but one of the dogwoods that we got was not the variety we thought it would be. It should have been low and spread out, 
And in 18 months, every single plant out here grew to full maturity. The bioengineered soil, I don't know, just great weather in Spokane, but I didn't mind that the plants grew up in the middle thick. No one cared about that. That was actually intentional. We did a speed study and did some national studies to show that if you can't see across the lane that's coming towards you, you initially, it boxes you in a little bit and slows you down. So I didn't mind that in the middle, but all of a sudden I was getting phone calls in June saying, I can't see to cross, I can't see to turn. I'm like, what are you talking about? And I went out there and um, yeah, it was terrible. We probably spent $30,000 in removing plants, uh, replanting shorter. These aren't very, I don't have a ton of good pictures of it, but I have one sitting in my truck where you can't see anything. Um, and yeah, so that was quite the little fix and we had to do it in a big hurry because it was a safety concern. And so part of our overall landscape and maintenance plans now is regular visitation. The liability is not on our contractor to say, hey, it looks like it's a site distance issue. It's our job to go out and identify that, and then we let them know how often to do the site distance trimming. Uh, vehicle drive-offs, okay, I've lived in Spokane my entire life. I drove through the asphalt channel in the snow. It was fun, everyone did that. I don't think anyone is driving through anymore intentionally. Um, we've had a rollover. Um, we have people drive through it all the time. Believe it or not, it's not that expensive. I think our average cost is like $1,500 a year. Some years it's 100 bucks. We mostly have them just repair the, um, the irrigation and we don't worry so much about the plants because honestly, once things get growing, we do trim it back every year because another problem that we had was because we weren't trimming it back. Um, the plants just come back, so we don't ever really fill stuff in anymore. Um, we just repair the irrigation and move on. So voles and gophers, who would have expected that? I didn't. Um, so the winter of 2016 wasn't necessarily the coldest winter in Spokane, but we had a ton of snow. And the next spring comes up and our plants, it's like everything is greening up, but a lot of the ornamental grasses just were not popping back. And it took multiple trips, bring out the, the landscape architect, bring out the contract, the, you know, everybody, what is going on out here? Eventually, and I'm not even joking, when you, those are all chewed up, you know, I, I accused someone of coming out with a weed whacker because some of this looked so precise. That's gophers. <laughs> um, there were little tunnels and you, they were running all over the place. It was ridiculous. And I was just like, boy, I didn't sign up for this. I don't know what to do. Um, so we bought bait boxes, yeah. uh, we bought bait boxes, um, our, part of our annual maintenance is to put down mole chase, which is a castor oil product, and it's just a deterrent. You're never going to eradicate them, we have too much open area not too far away. Um, but we really have knocked down the, we've knocked them down, and the cost annually for that is around $2,000 a year to maintain the bait boxes and have them checked and filled. So. You know, it's better. Um, our banners that we have up out there that mimic the entry monuments. Um, we've had a couple broken brackets. Uh, my favorite is this, especially on a Sunday when someone calls and says, you have a geyser, and then I have to find someone to go out and turn the water off. Um, but that's kind of a normal thing. So here's a couple pictures of what the project looks like today. I'll just run through a couple, some of the numbers. Um, the engineer's estimate was $2.3 million. The low bid was 1.9. We still finished under the 2.3, even with a couple of larger change orders. The pipe was about a half a million dollars. The plants, okay, the public went crazy. They thought we had, we were in cahoots with somebody over the plant contract because yeah, 25,000 plants. But the plants were about 4% of the overall cost. It was maybe $90,000 total for the purchase and installation of the plants. So not that big a deal. Um, the topsoil was $200,000. Um, our cost to irrigate it, so the last two years it's only been about $3,400 a year, which I don't, if you do the math on if we had sodded this, it would have been so much more than that, um, which was the intention of why we did plants versus sod. Um, and let's see what else. Our annual maintenance is about $7,000 a year. So it's really not that much money. We employ our... Geiger work release crew to do some weeding and some, you know, a little bit of maintenance and trash pickup, but we have a landscape contractor 
who does the herbicide and you know gets the irrigation up and going and repairs it. But so um, that is about it. That's it. Any questions?